Jesus Christ is risen today. Alleluia. A triumphant holy day. Alleluia. Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter. Welcome to the Chapel of Christian Faith, and we are so delighted to be here. We're sorry that you can't be here, but your faces are here. I see Brother Lowell Allen right down here in front, and next to him is Kenny Wecht, and the rest of you are in your places, and we're so delighted that we can be here to help you celebrate Easter. Would you please respond with, He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He has risen indeed. He is risen. He has risen indeed. Amen. Would you join me in a word of prayer as we begin? Oh, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that although our congregation is in their own homes and we are apart, that we can be together in spirit, that that we are united together through Jesus Christ, and we celebrate his resurrection this morning. And Father, we can face tomorrow because he lives. And we are so very thankful to be able to lead our congregation in worship in this place. We ask that you bless this service, bless everything that we sing, every note that's played, every word that's spoken. We give it to you and we do it for your honor and for your glory. And we do so in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to introduce to you uh, Griff, who most of you probably know, and Ed Leonard. And I want to thank them for being a part of our service this morning. We're going to sing for you and hope you can worship with us right in your own homes. And this first one you know, and we sing it because we know that we can face tomorrow because he lives. Amen. 
God sent His Son. They called Him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. How sweet to hold our new pride and joy he gives but greater still that calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear. I'll fight life's fight No war with pain And then as death Gives way to victory I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns because he lives I can face tomorrow because he We'd like to continue our worship this morning with a well-known and loved Easter hymn, He Lives. And you ask me how I know He lives? He lives 
within my heart. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, he lives, he lives, he lives Christ Jesus, Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, he lives, he lives salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. All the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, he lives, he lives Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, he lives salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my Rejoice, rejoice, O Christians, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, he lives, he lives Christ he Jesus lives, lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, he lives, he lives salvation to him all. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Good morning, Chapel family. Happy Easter, or better yet. Happy Resurrection Day. It occurs to me that many of you are spending possibly your first Easter ever not in church. But I remind you that this Sunday, this Easter, this Resurrection Day is probably more like the original than we're thinking. On that day, there was an empty tomb. Today we have an empty church. On that day, the disciples, the believers were hunkered down in their houses for safety, just like you are today. I want to remind you that because we can't get together and attend church, we can still be the church and we can worship. I know Pastor Jeff has already uh, gone through the drill, but I want to go through it again. 
On this day, we celebrate the resurrection. So I want you to respond as you know to do. Uh, He is risen. Oh, that was really weak. Really weak. Let me hear you again. He is risen. risen Oh, we're getting a little bit better one more time. Stand up this time. Uh, Your neighbors already think you're crazy, so don't worry about it. He is risen. risen Praise God. Would you all pray with me? Father, we are thankful for this day. All time divides on the birth of Jesus Christ who came to die and pay for our sins. Lord, we are thankful for all that you do. We are thankful for the salvation that we have in Christ, that we know that faith alone in Christ alone gives eternal life with you. Not because of our works, but because of his, his perfect work. Thank you, Lord. Now, Lord, I pray that the meditations of our hearts, the words of my mouth would be pleasing unto you. I ask in the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. I want you to imagine what it might have been like that first resurrection day. Can you use your imagination a little bit? What if something like that happened today? And, of course, that would be the news. What if there were cameras and news crews in that day and age and we're sitting at home watching on the news and all of a sudden they break in with a special report and flashing across the screen is a banner saying resurrection or Roos. And we're, what is this? And, and then a few more banners go by. Jesus is missing. And then we see pictures flashing across the screen. We see the disciples running towards the tomb to check it out for themselves. We see a close-up of Pilate as he distances himself from any kind of involvement in this, being the politician that he is. We see an interview with gruff soldiers who are swearing that the body was stolen. No, we see a switch and the cameras go on to the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders of the Sanhedrin. And as the cameras are pushed in their face, they push them away. They refuse to give answer to any questions. And then sweet Mary Magdalene, an interview with her. And Mary Magdalene is swearing that she saw the resurrected Jesus just minutes ago. And then they switch to a psychologist that is reporting Mary is not in her right mind. Uh, As a matter of fact, she is deluded. Uh, She is suffering from post-traumatic distress order. But what if we could speak to an eyewitness today? You see that many of these events, the resurrection, it's still argued by many today. Uh, We of faith know from history it is a proven fact. We know from history that our faith is not in our Bible. Our Bible informs us of our faith. Oh, but our trust, the epicenter of our faith, is what we celebrate today. The empty tomb. The empty tomb. Because he lives, we live. What if we could talk to an eyewitness? What if we could have the Apostle John here? What might he say? Now, we do have some of his information, so as I go into a character of John, just understand I'm not an actor, but I believe this is a story that needs to be told over and over and over again. John gave us a lot of the story in his gospel, John chapter 20. You can read that later on. But for now... What I would like to do is I would like to tell you about the greatest story ever told as the Apostle John might tell us today. So what might John say to us today? I think he might say something like this. I awoke Sunday morning with a splitting headache. 
Oh, who am I kidding? I hadn't slept. I hadn't slept since Thursday morning. I couldn't sleep. My world had been turned upside down. We went from a hopeful state to a hopeless state. Everything that we had lived for vanished. Here we had our group. We were following Jesus for three years, a little over three years. And all in a night it fell apart. As we lived through those three years, things were wonderful. We saw Jesus perform miracle after miracle after miracle. And you all think that we had it figured out. We knew that he was the Messiah. We knew that he was the unique son of God. We did not. We were processing. We were figuring it out, but we had not figured it out. We still didn't know. Here, we would watch as Jesus would perform miracles. Water to wine. Walking on water. Calming the storm. Driving out evil spirits. And we would ask, who is he? Who is he? Now, you know and I know that Peter said, you are the Christ. But Peter said a lot of stuff. And not all of it was true. And so we didn't know for sure. And then as we were on our way back to Jerusalem, we stopped and Jesus was going to pay his last respects, or so we thought, to Lazarus. And when he yelled into the tomb, come out Lazarus, we thought, oh, this is awkward. Jesus is starting to believe uh, a little much of himself, isn't he? <laughs> then Lazarus walks out. Who is he? Who is this Jesus? Well, then, fast forward to that night. And here we are all celebrating Passover. And Jesus started to drop those bombshells one at a time. He's going to leave. Where are you going? Uh, Judas, one of us is going to betray. It was Judas. Whoever would have thought Judas would betray him. Peter would deny him that very night. And then at the garden, when the soldiers showed up, we all ran. We all ran. Most of us have been in hiding ever since. I ventured to go to the cross. I can't tell you how horrible that was. Words escaped me to watch my Lord, my friend, being beaten and hung on a cross. And now he's dead. And when I woke up that morning, I woke up to a shrill sound that I could hear outside in a distance, and it was getting closer and closer. And closer, and as it got closer to me, I realized it was the voice of a hysterical woman. Pretty soon, she burst through the door. Well, it was Mary Magdalene. And she was so hysterical, I could not understand what she was saying. Peter could not understand what she was saying. And we thought, all right, crazy Mary. That's what we called her. I mean, Jesus had cast out seven demons from her, but we thought, well, those demons are back, and Mary's gone crazy again. But she wasn't. We finally calmed her down enough, and she said, they've stolen Jesus' body. She didn't get those words out before Peter was out the door. And before I knew it, I was running after Peter. Now I'm thinking to myself, as my, my feet are running ahead of my common sense, if we get caught at the gravesite, they're going to do to us what they did to Jesus. But that didn't stop us. You see, we had to know. And so we ran, and I ran faster than Peter, and I got there, and as I was approaching, I could see that the stone had been moved away. Who could move such a heavy stone away? It must have taken a group of people. Why would they steal his body? And as I ran up there, I peered inside. And as I'm peering inside, I could see the grave clothes 
on the shelf. And then I could see, and before I could think any more, something hit me from behind and smashed me right into the front of the rock. It was Peter. Peter got there after me, and he ran right in. And as I looked at Peter, I walked in myself, and here we both are. And Peter's looking at the shelf with the grave clothes. We both noticed that the head cloth that was on Jesus was folded. If somebody stole his body, why would they leave the grave clothes? Why would they unwrap him? Why would they fold? What is going on here? And I looked at Peter, and Peter looked at me. And for the first time in his life, he was speechless. He just looked at me with a blank stare, and his jaw hung down. As I looked, I started to remember what Jesus had told us many times. And I looked at the cloths, and I looked at the headcloth, and I realized and I started to laugh. I'm sorry, I couldn't hold it. I just, I just started to laugh. And Peter looked at me like I was insane. And I started to laugh. I said, Peter, <laughs> don't you realize he's alive? He's alive. He is risen as he said he would. That's what I think John might say. You see, Jesus gave them hope in a hopeless time. Here we have these disciples who, have gone, who had gone from a hopeful state to a hopeless state to a hope, an undying hope, a confidence. In just a few days, how awesome what God can do in just a few days. Today, some look at this grand holiday, Easter, as a religious holiday sp sprinkled with some facts. The truth is, this is an historical event bathed in religious overtones. You see, the God of Passover, as they celebrated what God had done, was at work again. The God of Passover, who had rescued the Jews from bondage, was again at work. But this time, not just for the Jews, but for all humanity, for all time, even those of us today. He was at work again, releasing them from bondage from sin and death. But like the Jews, they had to trust in God. They had to spread sacrifice to lamb and put the blood on the door frame. God doesn't call us to do that today, but they had to act by faith and follow God. And they were delivered out of bondage that same God was at work again. And by faith, he will deliver you and me from bondage. How will he do that? I think some of you already know, but we'll get there in just a moment. What I want you to realize is that disciples, just a few nights before, ran for their lives. They ran away. But none of them ever ran again not after the resurrection. You see, from then on, they lived supernatural lives. But not a one of them died a natural death. They were martyred. What made the difference? In a word, hope. In a word, hope. Not hope in the Bible. Not hope in religion. Not hope in man. Hope in Jesus. Based on a fact that the tomb was empty, and they had met the resurrected Jesus. What kind of hope are we talking about? You see, biblical hope isn't the way we use hope today. We use hope today as wishful thinking. Uh, we might say, I have hope that maybe one day I could fly. 
um, wishful thinking. That's not biblical hope. Biblical hope is a confident expectation, as if we would say, well, I hope the sun comes up tomorrow. Well, of course it is. And when we talk about biblical hope, and we talk about the hope that they lived with, it was a confident expectation that God would do what he said he would do. You see, the writer of Hebrews says that we have this hope as an anchor for our soul. The focus of that hope? Jesus Christ, the empty tomb, and his promise to come back for us. Why is hope so significant, so important? I think you all know this, but bear with me. Listen to uh, this recent story. Uh, An acquaintance of Patty had written to her and said, Well, it all has begun. It was last week that she was on her way to work in Tampa, Florida, And as she approached the building where she worked, she could not get into the parking lot. There was 10 police cars blocking her way and waving her off. Well, she was curious, so she pulled over to the side. And she got out of the car, and she began to look where everybody else was looking. And what did she see? She saw a man standing up outside at the eighth floor, working up the courage to jump. Why? He had lost his job. The coronavirus and, and all that is happening, he lost his job and lost who knows what else. But one thing's for sure, that man had lost hope. And without hope, we don't live. One author put it this way. He wrote, man can live 40 days without food. He can live three days without water. He can live about eight minutes without air, but only for one second without hope. Hope is crucial. We know it. God knows it. So what is this hope that sustains me, that can sustain you? Thought you'd never ask. You see, this hope is not in everyone, but it is for everyone. We must trust in what God tells us to trust in. It's trusting alone in Christ alone. Family, you hear me say it all the time, but let me explain to you again. The Apostle John had made it so clear when he recorded Jesus' words that night when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus. When Jesus told him about the love of God, he told him about the gift of God and the offer of God. You know the verse. John 3, 16. For God has so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. In this, we hear the love of God. For God so loved, well, you can put your name in there. For God so loved Jeff, God so loved Corrine, God so loved Tom, God so loved Keith, God so loved you. You see, it's a little difficult sometimes for us to believe that God loves us because one thing we do know about God is he is a holy God. He's never made a mistake. He's never done anything wrong. And yet we in our hearts know we've done many things wrong. Even today, we know of our wrong thoughts. We know of our ill tempers. We know of Well, the list goes on. And so if we were ever in the presence of God, we would not, or what we would expect from him is not an embrace, but a backhand. We would expect for him to give us the backhand of correction. And yet God tells us here, for God so loved you, he's giving you an embrace. Not a backhand, but open arms. And for God so loved you that he gave, that God gave you a gift and me a gift 2,000 years ago. It's what we celebrate today. That gift was the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. You see, Jesus was your substitute and my substitute. He came for the key reason to pay for your sin. All the things that we've done wrong. 
And sin simply means you've missed the mark. You've missed the target. You've aimed at it if it was an arrow, and you missed the bullseye. That's what sin means. And the Bible says we've all done it. We've all sinned. I think you'll agree. You've not lived a perfect life. That's the goal of God. And so no one makes it. So God brought his son, and he gave us a gift. And Jesus went to the cross willingly, and he laid his life down. And he paid for your sins. Those ones yesterday, those ones 5, 10, 20, 30, go back as far as you want. And the ones you've not yet committed, Jesus paid it all. That's a gift. <laughs> it's what we celebrate today. Is the gift of resurrection. But there's an offer. And here's the offer. God has given us an offer. Go back to the verse with me, if you will. You can open up your Bible if you want to John 3, 16. For God has so loved you that he gave, there's a gift, that he gave his one and only son. Now here's the offer. That whoever, did you hear that? Whoever. Uh, we tend to think, well, this offer must be to uh, clergy and to good people, uh, maybe to rich people, maybe to people who attend church, maybe to people who give generously to this or to that or to the church or people who are fill in the blank. And yet, God himself says, whoever. That's all inclusive, folks. That whoever. Now, what do you need to do? Well, here's the list of things you need to do. If you ask somebody, what do you need to do to get to heaven? They're going to have lists and maybe not even an exhaustible list. They'll just go on and on and on. But God has a list of things for you to do. And they're stated right in this verse. Can you see it? For God so loved you that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes, whoever trusts in his son will have eternal life. Did you hear that? God gives us eternal life when we trust alone in Christ. It's not me plus my church attendance. It's not me plus what I give. It's not plus anything. It's Jesus plus nothing. It's a gift from God. Have you gone to God to tell him? Today would be a great day to do that. It's God's will. He clearly states that he wants for no one to leave this earth apart from trusting in Christ. Oh, it's too easy. But it's not. It wasn't easy for Jesus. It wasn't easy for God. But he thought you were worth it. Even today, you can go and you can go to God in prayer right there at home in your own privacy and say, God, I understand from your word that I've done wrong. I freely admit that. I need a Savior, and I understand that Jesus is the one who died for me. He paid it all, and right now I'm trusting in Christ as the only way to heaven. God, save me. And he will. If today is the day you've done that, I would love for you to go to our website and send us a letter letting us know that you trusted Jesus today. There are at least three benefits from this salvation. One of them is a new relationship. When you trust in Christ, the Bible tells us that you come into a new relationship. Uh, listen to what John wrote in chapter 1, verse 12, speaking of Jesus, yet to all who received Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Aren't we all children of God? Many say that, but that's not what God says. When we are born, we are a creation of God. When we trust in Christ, we become a child of God, and you enter into a whole new relationship with God. He adopts you. Many of you uh, can remember the day that you were adopted, the day that you trusted Christ. Uh, folks who adopt celebrate not only the birthday of the child that they adopted, but they 
also celebrate another day. It's called Gotcha Day. And it's the day that the adoption became official. What is your gotcha day? Is it today or is it in the past? I pray that you have a gotcha day. But not only do we have a relationship with God when we are saved, we have fellowship with him. Uh, there's still knowing that we are not perfect. <laughs> we tend to think that God's going to lock us in a room and say, look, um, I saved you. Don't expect anything more. No, God says, I want fellowship with you daily. We have fellowship. John tells us in 1 John 1, 3 that we have fellowship with God and fellowship with the Son. But not only that, when we trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us. And the Holy Spirit is the counselor that gives us wisdom. Uh, he convicts us of sin. He guides us into truth. And he comforts us. But not only that, God, when you trust in Christ, he gives you a relationship with other believers. The Bible says that we were baptized into the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And so God, when we trust in Christ, he invites us to be his child. He adopts us. He gives us a relationship and fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Guidance and power to live every day. But not only a new relationship, but a new reality. When we trust in Christ, this hope, this gift, this salvation brings us into a new reality. The Bible says that we are no longer slaves to sin. Before we trust in Christ, we have no choice. You have to sin. Once you trust in Christ, you have true freedom. Do you remember the days when we did not have caller ID? If your phone rang at home, you had to answer it to find out who was on the other end. Ah, but today, when that phone rings, it comes up on caller ID, and we can say, I'm not answering that one. Well, you see, it's that way now. We are no longer slaves to sin. Before Christ, before we trusted him, when temptation rang up, we had to answer it. We had no choice. Oh, there was a few times that we could not answer it, but most of the time we did. Now we can look at caller ID and say, I'm not answering that one because I have the power to overcome because the Holy Spirit is in me. And so we have a new reality, no longer slaves to sin, but we also have the ability to stand against the devil's schemes. Ephesians 6, 10 through 17 inform us of that. And not only that, we have access to infinite wisdom. James tells us, tells us if we lack wisdom, we can go to God who gives generously to all. More than that, we have promise that God will answer our prayers. Jesus said, until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. What a great reality. We're no longer slaves to sin. We have the ability to stand against the devil's schemes. We have access to infinite wisdom daily, moment by moment. And we have a promise for answered prayer. But not only a new relationship, we have a new reality. But third and last, we have a new hope and a secure future. Paul says it very succinctly in Romans 8.1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In Ephesians, the Apostle Paul tells us we are sealed in Christ. We can't lose the salvation that God has given us. Jesus said it. Even Jesus said it. In John 5, 24, Jesus said, If anyone hears my voice and believes in him who sent me, has eternal life, and will not be condemned. They've crossed over from death to life. Did you hear his words? You may ask, I hear him say, if anyone hears my voice and believes in him who sent me has eternal life, that's present. You have it when you trust in Christ. Well, who is Jesus? I remind you, God. He knows all things. He is the judge. The Father turned all judgment over to the Son. You're listening to the Son when he says you have eternal life. Well, can I lose it? No. 
you will not be condemned. Look at John 5, 24. Jesus' words, not mine. If anyone hears my voice and believes in him who sent me, has eternal life and will not be condemned. Why? Because he's crossed over from death to life. I like to think of it as Jesus burned the bridge. You can't go back. You're secure. And so when we trust in Christ, we celebrate the hope that we get on this resurrection day. We enter into a relationship when we trust in Christ, a new and fresh relationship with the God of the heavens. We have favor with God. We have a new reality. We can't lose the salvation we have, and that's our new hope and our new security. Why? Because God, through Jesus, has redeemed you. He's purchased you. He's paid the price, and he's bought you out of the sin market and the market of death. You know, for me, I don't live my life the way I do because I have to or because I'm trying to be more righteous. But I understand what God has given to me. And so I live my life as a thank you note to him. To know that I've been invited into a relationship with God. He knows all my faults. He knows my errors. He knows the times that I've intentionally sinned and done wrong. He knows everything about me, and yet he saved me. You see, Jesus died for me. I want to live for him. That's the kind of person, that's the kind of God I want to be with. Don't you? He's given me a quality of life and a secure future that I could not even dream for. Why would I not want to follow him? I end with this story. You've heard it before. This story may be true. It may not be true, but I can tell you the principle was true when it comes to Jesus. Many years ago, back in the 1800s, a man came upon a slave auction. And there on the auction block was a, a beautiful, young, African-American girl being auctioned off as a slave. And he started to bid on her, and the bidding went back and forth. Finally, he won the bid. When he motioned for the girl to come with him, his new property unwillingly followed him. You see, it seemed that she knew what was going on. As a young, beautiful slave girl, she knew that she would be at the whim of this white man who would do what he wanted and toss her aside as a piece of mere property, being treated as less than a pet. And so as she followed him, he turned around and he looked at her. And he looked at her and he said, you're free. And she answered back incredulously, what do you mean I'm free? You just bought me. He said, you're free. She asked, you mean I'm free to say what I want to say? His reply was, yes, you are. You mean that I'm free to do whatever I want to do and be whoever I want to be? He answered, yes, you're free. Haltingly, she said, you mean I can go wherever I want to go? He looked back at her and he said, yes. You can go wherever you want to go. Her eyes filled with tears. And as she began to weep, she said, then I want to follow you. Can I go with you? This story is told of Abraham Lincoln. He was the person that had bought and freed this girl. Is it true? I don't know. The principle is true. This is exactly what Jesus has done for you. He's purchased you. When you trust alone in Christ alone, you have the freedom to follow him. And I don't know about you, but that one who paid the price for my life gives me eternal life, who brings me into a relationship with the Most High God who created all things. Is that God who has given me a new reality and a hope and a future that is secure? 
that's someone I want to follow. That's someone I want to please. The Apostle Paul said it this way, Yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. How about you? Believer, I challenge you on this resurrection day to step it up, to go to God, to recommit, to tell him, I'll say what you want me to say. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go. You'll never regret it. If you've never trusted Christ, today is your day. He's calling you right now. Respond. Don't wait. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the amazing grace that you give us, the amazing, even radical grace that you would save people such as, well, me. Father, I thank you, and I praise you, and I ask that you would draw many to yourself today. I pray, Father, once again, that our thoughts and our ponderings would be pleasing to you as the words of our mouths are. I ask with great expectation that you will do a mighty work here because you are faithful. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue our worship this morning with some music, and we are very blessed this morning to have Kareen here. I'm so delighted that she's willing to come, and she's going to share a couple of Easter songs in the hymn medley. Kareen.
Amen. I hope all of you at home are joining me in saying amen. Wonderful. And thank you, Corrine, for sharing your gifts with us this morning. Jesus Christ is alive. He lives. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Let's close our service this morning with probably the most well-known of all hymns, Amazing Grace. We saw God's amazing grace what Jesus accomplished at the cross. And then we saw that grace fulfilled as Jesus rose from the dead. And we are so thankful. We're going to sing the first two verses. Then Corrine's going to play a verse. And then we'll sing the last verse. One, two, and five. And I think all of you can do these from memory. Because I'm most confident that you know this song, Amazing Grace. <laughs> Thank you, Corrine. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. Thank you all for listening in. Would you all please pray with me now? Father, we celebrate what you have done. We celebrate Jesus Christ. We celebrate and exalt you because you will see all things to an end for you are a perfect God and you follow through on everything, every promise. And Lord, you told us now to you who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. I praise you, Father. And Lord, I pray that you would use us even this day to share the hope that is in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with us. May God bless you.